Hey everybody, I'm really excited to be here on this Sunday evening and present this very first webinar for the group. Uh, this is part one of Herbs and Pagans, and we're going to start by uh, doing some housekeeping so that everybody knows how this is going to function. We'll go through the presentation tonight. I'm not going to read every single slide I prepared for you because I assume everybody here can read. If you can't read, please raise your hands. Oh, never mind, I can't see you anyway. We'll just assume you can read. Now, we'll be doing this every other Sunday, and on the alternate Sundays, uh, my better half and much better looking and younger than me, Kelly, will be presenting Wicca and Paganism, uh, which will give you an understanding of Wicca and, and how it relates to Paganism. So if you're interested in learning more about Wicca, be sure to tune in to Kelly's webinars. So before I begin, I actually have to make a disclaimer. Under federal law, I'm required to tell you that the information in this webinar is purely informational and should never be used in place of seeing your doctor. You'll understand why I had to say that under the law later on in this presentation. Anyway, that piece of legal mumbo jumbo is out of the way for now. My name is Dave. I'm one of the admins for this group, and also a green witch and herbalist. I hold a few PhDs, uh, including an MD, and I'm the green witch, as I said earlier, which is actually the thing I'm most proud of. One of the unique things about being a green witch is I get to actually use herbs on a daily basis and see the benefits that they provide us. Okay, that's the housekeeping out of the way. Oh, and if you do have questions, just type them in the comments below and we will answer them as we go along. This will be done relatively quickly tonight if we can, because we have some time limits imposed on us by, of course, uh, Facebook. But one of the things we're going to be doing is watching a video towards the end of this slideshow. And I want you to pay close attention to that video when we get there. And finally, a free gift. Yes, we promised you a free gift if you attended tonight. And I guarantee that we will give you the information on how to get that free gift. But of course, we'll do it at the very end, just to make sure you stick around. So if you want to grab a drink, go to the bathroom, get some refreshments, turn off that football game you're watching or whatever, go ahead and do it now. We're going to get started. Okay, so herbs, we all know what they are. We use them in cooking. We use them, some of us, in healing. And a lot of us use them in our spells. Now, the history of herbalism, well, that's kind of tied in with the history of medicine. And it's been that way since prehistoric times. And uh, we'll find out exactly why that changed in the 19th century a bit. It also changed in the Middle Ages, and we'll discover why it changed there, too. And despite that today we have pharmaceutical drugs, um, which, by the way, are often derived from herbs and plants, um, and they have largely replaced herbal treatments within our modern healthcare system. And that's, that's a, a, a sad change. And it's resulted in thousands and thousands of unneeded deaths, as you'll learn later. Now, you might ask why we're looking at the history of herbs when this is supposed to be herbs and pagans. Well, it's really quite simple. Without understanding the history of herbs and why everything changed in the 19th century, you won't understand why it's important for every single person on this planet to start looking at herbs again and looking at them as our pagan ancestors did. Now, also, herbs overlap with food, right? And so the history of herbalism overlaps with food history because many of the herbs and spices have historically been used by us to season food. When we season that food, of course, those spices 
create antimicrobial activity in the cooking. And that's an ancient response to the threat of foodborne pathogens, you know, like botulism and salmonella and all those other wonderful things. Herbs, of course, have been around longer than we have. We know that the herbs and plants of today are slightly different from the time of the dinosaurs, but a lot of them are exactly the same. Our herbs and plants appeared before human form appeared on this earth. They have always been infused with some very special properties. Those of you who are old enough will remember a commercial on television for butter in which the tagline was, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. And that's exactly true when it comes to herbology. You just can't mess with something that nature created and that has the divine spark in it. So these herbs have always been infused with their special properties. And they were the primary source for many animals before humans even appeared on this earth. And they've been around since prehistoric times, as we said. If you ever get to France, you need to go down to the Las Col cave paintings. That actually depicts cave people using herbs. And carbon dating of those uh, shows them to be between 13,000 and 25,000 BC. Um, that's quite a long time ago. Of course, once those plants were in place, along came man didn't take him very long to figure out exactly how herbs could help him. There's some archaeological evidence that shows humans were using medicinal plants during the Paleolithic era, and that's one of the earliest eras that we can trace humanity back to. And it makes perfect sense. You know, back then, we all had a sixth sense, and Many of you still have it, although the vast populate, the vast majority of the population, they no longer tap into their sixth sense. Mothers do on a daily basis. Every single mother knows that her intuition when it comes to her children is a wonderful example of the sixth sense. Anyway, so these, these Paleolithic humans, they knew their life literally depended on their environment, and they had a keen sense of awareness. So they began to recognize how different plants could be used to treat specific illnesses. We also know that animals seek out plants when they're sick. If you, if you want an example of this, think of a dog going outside eating some grass. Now, why does that dog eat the grass? Well, he has an upset stomach. There's something wrong with his digestive tract. He instinctively knows that that grass contains micro elements that will help his stomach feel better. Nothing magical about this, folks. It's just common sense. So if we look at, at herbs, we also look at the beginning of medicine the ancient Chinese, Indians, Egyptians, Babylonians, and the Native Americans, every single one, they were herbalists. The oldest known of list of medicinal herbs, although not written down where it could easily be accessed, was Xinen Yong Pian Tiao's Xinong Ben Chiao Jing's, which was written 3000 BC, and it's a Chinese herbal that is a compilation of an even older oral tradition that was passed down. We know that Greeks and Romans also had several renowned herbalists among their population. And surgeons traveling with the Roman army began to spread their expertise on herbs throughout their empire. That means it spread to Germany, Spain, France, England. And pretty soon it became obvious they had to write a book so some of the surgeons in the Roman army compiled herbals that were called the Materia Medicia. And those texts are about 1,500 years old. And we still have them around today. Now, of course, we're talking about herbs and pagans, so we have to talk about the gods and the goddesses. Anyway, the earliest known writing about medicine 
was a 110-page Egyptian papyrus, and it was written around 16 BC and supposedly by the god Toph. So pagans now had a book they could use to start expanding their knowledge of herbs. As you can see, the title of this slide is All Medicine Comes from Plants. Well, not all medicine comes from plants. Some of it actually comes from minerals. Some of it comes from chemical compounds that pharmaceutical companies have put together. But all good medicine comes from plants. The ancient Romans and Greeks crowned their leaders with dill and laurel, and they also used that dill to purify the air, kind of an early concept of smudging that we do today. In the 5th century BC, Hippocrates, a famous Greek physician, listed about 400 herbs that he had in common use and their benefits. And that led in 65 AD to a Greek physician serving with the Roman army, writing that De Materia Medicia, in which he described the medicinal uses of many herbs. And even today, that book is considered one of the most influential herbal books. Okay, but what about some of the herbs those Egyptians we were talking about? What kind of herbs did they use? We really haven't talked about herbs. We've talked about the history of herbs, but I'm sure every single person listening to this and watching this wants to know, are there really benefits to these herbs? Well, sure there are. Now there's a bunch of them here, as you can see. Um, a lot more than I'm gonna read to you. So you can just peruse this list and, and take a look at some of the common uses for some very common herbs. Now, I want you to pay close attention to some of, the, some of the herbs that we're pretty familiar with. So let's take a look at this one right here, aloe vera. Everybody uses it when they get a burn, they have an insect bite. But did you know that aloe vera, for example, can be used to treat worms? It, it relieves headaches. It can soothe chest pain. It's great for ulcers and, of course, for skin diseases and for allergies. That's just one example of one of the herbs that the Egyptians identified and how they used it. And there's several more on here. Uh, and it, actually, this is obviously only a small sample of the 800 plus that they list. Uh, but if you look at some of these, it's pretty interesting. Let's take a look at mustard, for example. Now, they're not talking about that yellow mustard you get in a little squeeze bottle. They're talking about the mustard and mustard seed in particular. But look at this, it induces vomiting and it relieves chest pains. Now, you may wonder why the Egyptians wanted to induce vomiting. Well, I'm pretty sure there were times they had little too much to drink after a long day at the pyramids. And as we all know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Anyway, that's one of the uses they had for it. And finally, one I want you to pay close attention to is right here where it says garlic. Now, garlic gives vitality, it soothes, soothes flatulence or excess gas, and it aids in digestion. It's a mild laxative, and believe it or not, it shrinks hemorrhoids. The original preparation H, garlic. During the building of the pyramids, the workers were given garlic daily to give them vitality, to rid the body of spirits, and give them the strength to carry on building those big, big monuments. So that's a small sample of the contents in the Egyptian book. We haven't mentioned the Sumerians. Now, the Sumerians actually compiled a list of herbs on clay tablets. Uh, sadly, the clay tablets deteriorate over time, so we don't have a complete uh, look at, at everything that they contained on those tablets with their herbal knowledge. <coughs> but we do know that the use of herbs and plants as medicine spread across the known world for centuries. It was often considered the trade of the wise ones or the cunning folk. 
who would later become known as witches. People would seek out those learned members of their community whenever sickness struck. Of course, we also have to keep in, time, in, keep in mind that at this time, just about everybody in the world was pagan. There was no other religions around. They were all pagan sects. And so many of these sects began to write down herbal remedies. And they wrote them down on papyrus or in books. So one of the first book of shadows was likely just a book filled with herbal remedies that work like magic. But a terrible disease is heading our way, folks. And that disease will seek to end the rule of the herbalists. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, if you have questions, type them in the comments section below. <clears throat> we'll answer them for you. In the Middle Ages, herbs were often used to help preserve meats. It was also used as a covering for the rotting taste of meals that couldn't be refrigerated. So if you had a rotting piece of meat, yeah, just poured rosemary all over it. Tasted okay, but probably not great for you. Herbs also help mask the odors of people who bathed irregularly, if at all. Then the Black Death comes. What happens during the Black Death? Well, herbs can't help that. That's not a illness that herbs can remedy. It's not even an illness that back then any other medical knowledge could remedy. It was simply because the towns were filthy. Of course, people began to doubt those cunning folk, those wise ones, and their herbal medicine because they just couldn't help. And the church stepped in. It saw an opportunity to rid itself of everybody who opposed its views, mostly the pagans and those who believed in herbal medicine. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, the church believed that God caused everything for a reason and that God himself could turn around and make people better. It would be a miracle. It just didn't happen that way. So the church decided to take it a few steps further. In fact, this was the time that we call the burning times. The church began burning herbalists, associating with witchcraft and paganism. It wasn't all that bad, though, because, you know, across the ocean there was a new world. And in that new world, the early settlers grew herbs for seasoning their food, as well as for medicinal pro uh, the properties. American Indians at the time of the Middle Ages were already using herbs for tanning and dyeing leather, and of course for medicine. And they taught many of the early settlers that came over about their use of herbs, including new discoveries like the tobacco poultice for skin injuries. Also, because it was very, very hard to grow herbs in the middle of winter, dry herbs became very, very, very popular during the period of discovery in the New World. Okay, time for a little break, folks. It's been pretty boring so far. You've just learned history. How about we learn how some of those herbs can be used? All right, let's talk about fennel. Fennel, ah, oh, yeah, that aids in digestion, kind of tastes a little licorice -y, so Kelly wouldn't like it. It can be chewed. It can be brewed in a tea for weight loss. It's great for gas relief or halitosis, or as the layman calls it, bad breath. It imparts strength and sexual virility and magically, it's supposed to prevent curses. Here's another little thing about fennel. Fennel is awesome for a baby with colic. A little bit of fennel tea, like a teaspoon, it is one of the best, oh, I can't say remedies. It has some wonderful properties you should probably try if you have an infant with colic. Okay, garlic, we've touched on garlic briefly. So garlic, it's great for your hair, although rubbing, on, rubbing it on your hair probably won't bring you a lot of friends. But it's good for your skin, 
digestion, your lungs, awesome for blood health. It lowers cholesterol and it lowers blood pressure. Can I say that or will the AMA get upset? Well, they really can't because studies have proven that it lowers cholesterol and blood pressure. It's great for ear infections, head colds, and the flu. When you can make it yourself at home, the little olive oil, make a tincture by just steeping some garlic in it for like an hour and a half, two hours. Perfect. How about ginger? Not the ginger on Gilligan's Island, but ginger, the root that we all seem to use occasionally. Well, ginger is a relaxing stimulant. Use it after a large meal to settle your stomach. And you know what? This is perfect time for this. You need to go buy ginger when you buy your turkey because next week you're going to have a large meal. Have some ginger ready. Make a little ginger tea and you'll be fine. It induces perspiration when you're trying to sweat out a fever. It has benefits to the liver. And for those of you who just want a nice romantic evening, it's a pretty powerful aphrodisiac. Sprinkle it in steeping raspberry leaf tea and, hey, don't do it yet. We're still doing the webinar. Wait. Rosemary. Rosemary is a nerve stimulant and a digestive aid. It'll help your memory. It can soothe headaches. It eases depression if you inhale it. Finally, one of my favorites. This is actually one of my favorite. They call it an herb. It's actually a plant, but it's one of my favorites of all times. Rose hips. Extremely high in vitamin C. Very nutritious. Take this in the winter. And, and I would suggest you drink a cup of rose hip tea once a day throughout the winter. I'm guaranteeing you it will prevent colds and flu. If you do get the flu, it'll help. If you get colds, it'll help. It'll help reduce fever. Just keep in mind it's a mild laxative, so one cup a day. Don't be doing 10 and then calling me up or IMing me saying, wow, guess what happened when I had 10 cups of rose hips? Because I know exactly what happened. And finally, it's good for acne too. Okay, that's enough of our fun times. Let's get back to some serious stuff about herbs and how they work throughout history. Following the Middle Ages, herbal medicine made a comeback. People rediscovered the value of herbs. They found out that in cooking, they made food fantastic. You know, I mean, think of Gordon Ramsay without herbs. <laughs> He'd be a pretty useless chef. Anyway, herbs became part of everyday life. Across the world, schools on herb and holistic medicine began. Instructors were not associated with the church back then, but the knowledge was so strong, the church didn't try to interfere this time with these pagans who were teaching healing through natural methods. In America, holistic schools outnumbered what would become known as traditional medical schools. The old folk tales of herbs and healing were revisited, and many found to have some basis in fact, in actual healing abilities. Did you know, for example, the first estrogen came from red clover? Wait a second. Companies began to f form, and they sought to provide herbs in a tablet form. Whoa, those were the pre-runners of today's pharmaceutical companies. Hold on, pharmaceutical companies? That can't be good. Well, the great age of herbalism was between the 15th and 17th century. Herbal books were just becoming available in English rather than Latin or Greek, and the first anonymous herbal book to be published in English was the Great Day Herbal of 1526. I'll let you read uh, on the screen right now about Nicholas Culpepper, who was really, really, really good into herbal medicine and cataloged hundreds of medicinal herbs. Now, in the later half of the 19th century, a group of physicians known as eclectics, and some of you eclectic witches, you may want to pay attention here, uh, combined botanical medicines with other substances and therapies to treat their patients. They integrated and employed many forms of treatment that were more innovative and inclusive than conventional medical treatments of the day. 
you know, those fun things like purging and bloodletting and the use of mercury-based medicines. Everything we know is wrong today. They knew it was wrong back then. Anyway, in the USA, this movement flourished in the latter part of the 19th century, especially herbal treatments. That is, until the formation of the Council on Medical Education by the American Medical Association in 1904. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the seminar, like right now. The American Medical Association decided that, you know, those herbalists and those homopathic medicine treatments, they're really good. So we need to figure out a way to put an end to them because that's not what we believe. You see, traditional herbalism had been regarded as a method of alternate medicine in the United States since the Flexen Report of 1910 led to the closing of the eclectic medical schools where botanical medicine was exclusively practiced. Now, the practice of prescribing treatments and cures to patients today requires a legal medical license in the USA. And the licensing of those professionals occurs at state level. There is currently no licensing or certification for herbalists in any state that precludes the rights of anyone to use, dispense, or recommend herbs. That's a pretty important statement that a lot of doctors and certainly a lot of pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know. Because it basically says you can use herbs and it's none of the government's business. You can't, however, prescribe herbs for somebody else and tell them it will cure them. Oddly enough, doctors can prescribe drugs and tell you it will cure you when they know full well it won't cure you. The reason they practice medicine instead of getting it right is it doesn't serve well to have a patient and make them 100% better. You lose business. With 80% of the world currently getting all of its medicine, or some of it, from herbs and plants, it's obvious the United States is behind the times and protecting pharmaceutical companies. Now, in just a second, we're going to play that video I talked to you about, and I want you to pay close attention to it. It's really, really an amazing video, and it gives you a lot of insight into how the AMA tried to kill herbal medicine. In fact, let's take a look at it right now. This is a great time to ask questions while you're watching this. Um, I actually have time to answer them right now.
Pretty disturbing, isn't it? Who knows where we'd be today if those medical schools that told alternative medicine like herbalism had been allowed to continue. Now, of course, there are good reasons to regulate and raise standards of learning facilities. But seriously, to close them all down? But things aren't dark. Not anymore. Things have started to change. And now accepted schools of medicine include osteopathic schools, as well as traditional medical schools. Nurse practitioners can now practice as primary care providers in many states. And happily, herbalism is once again gaining in popularity and being recognized and accepted in our expanding medical environment. You can see it throughout every aspect of our culture. There are great books being authored by herbalists that are bringing learning right into people's hands. Herbal remedies are now becoming commonplace in grocery stores. And there are now many herbal schools offering education to budding herbalists. Oh, and that reminds me, for all of you that follow this entire seminar series all the way through, there's not gonna be that many lessons, maybe four. You've already got through the first one pretty much. I'm going to give you access to a complete course on herbology. Okay, but you got to be here for every one of them, and you got to watch from the beginning to the end. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, so we've looked now at herbs and pagans throughout history and how herbs have always been the primary source of medicine and are now making a comeback despite the efforts of a couple of billionaires who wanted to boost pharmaceutical companies. And that pretty much brings us to the end of our webinar for tonight. Phew, that was a lot of history. Now next week, the webinar won't be on herbs. I'll be back in two weeks with our second episode. But next week, my better half, Kelly, will be here, and she'll be presenting the first in a series on Wicca and Paganism. You're going to discover a lot about Wicca and Paganism, and even seasoned practitioners will learn a lot. So you won't want to miss that series. And that'll be at the same time, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, next Sunday. In two weeks, I'll be back with another one, and we'll start to learn how herbs benefit each of us, and we'll start working with some herbs, okay? Oh, and don't forget, you get a free gift, right? I promised a free gift. It's lotions, potions, and other aphrodisiacs. So head on over to that address you see right there and get your free copy of that book. I'll give you something to do for the next week anyway. Hey, it's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed conversing with you all. Thanks for joining us tonight. Blessed be. And merry part.